Hello, this is Mark Holmes, Editorial Director of VIA Satellite, and we have another of our famous or infamous Thursday morning conversations. And this time we're going all the way to Florida to talk to a, a good friend of VIA Satellite, someone I've uh, talked to and interviewed many times, uh, Greg Weiler, founder of OneWeb and O3B. Uh, delighted to have you here today, Greg. Uh, firstly, how are you and the family doing? We're great. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and, uh, and the invitation here. Um, all is great. Uh, family is having a great time and you know we've been homeschooling for years so there's really not a lot of changes going on from the from the school perspective one of the things we, we talk about with these conversations is we, we sort of get a, a look at a, you know, what people have been doing over lockdown, what movies they've been watching, TV, music they've been listening to. So, so tell us a little bit um, about what you and the family, uh, any particular movies, any particular uh, TV that you've really enjoyed watching, watching together over lockdown? Ah, interesting. So um, on movies, uh, we like um, the some of the japanese anime so we've been watching some of some of those and nausicaa for instance which is fantastic um and ponyo we, we we enjoy now just to frame it out i have five kids they're six years to 15 year olds so we go well single 15 year olds but six-year-old twins and then then in the middle um eight, uh, no now 10 and 13 in the yep. middle so um so we have a wide variety of, of appetites uh and of course, it's always hard to find something that can be interesting across that age bracket. Of course. But so. I understand. My two daughters are 13 and four. So uh, uh, Disney Plus has certainly been very useful over, over lockdown. Well, I'll ask you about your sort of favorite movies personally. I mean, what are your sort of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if we take away, you know, the kids and family entertainment, what are your sort of things do you like to watch? Oh, interesting. Um, well, first of all, we don't actually have really TV, so mm -hmm. we we were uh, we cut the cord. We didn't have a cord to cut. We never really got into cable TV and things like that. Um, so we're not really TV watchers. We do watch movies on occasion, um, and of course, I I like to get special movies because then when you have a the, you can't go out to the theater, but if you can, there's yeah. some really nice theaters you can go to, and even in London where you can get kind of premium sort of home theater seating, or of course, then if we want to watch it, then you know, we have a, a theater that we can watch it in, but we want it to be like a good movie, right? And so I wait to the really good stuff, sort of Star Wars genre, of course, and those things. Um, really enjoy sci-fi, like, but sci-fi that has a high reality content to it, and that okay. that's really well thought through, so you say yes. Kind of like, uh, you know, Mars, for instance, right? Where, where it, it was, the book was much better, by the way, than the movie. Okay. I highly recommend you, 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 you uh, the Martian, you read the book and just scrap the movie. Not that, that uh, uh, Matt did a great job, but, but still, it's, the book is the, uh, uh, it gives you all the math okay. on potatoes and famine and calories and how to grow them. It just. It's... So, so give me one other, apart from, um... Is it the Martian or Mars? Uh, give me one other really good sci-fi movie where you feel it's just really well done. You know, it's more more real, if that makes sense. I suppose in terms of sci-fi, another one that you think's well worth a watch. So here's one that um, and I forgot the name. So this is going to give everybody a little riddle and a little work to do. And, but the premise was this: there was uh, it took place in the seventies and. Uh, America was under siege from the Cold War and Russia was going to blow them yeah. up. So what they did was they created a, 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 um, a computer called Cerberus that uh, was in a mountain in Denver. And what it did was it, it looked at all the news, right? So it was watching all the news, watching all the wire, wire uh, phone calls, there was an internet back then, everything that was going on and deciding when there would be a first strike from Russia so that it could preempt the first strike. And they spent you know, untold amounts of money to build it into a bunker in a mountain, and they had, um, they had all the security so the, co the computer could shut down any access to it. It was designed to continue on after the Russian invasion, right? So you couldn't get to it. So they built this Cerberus, this, this computer, and they turn it on, and it's a big fanfare that they turn it on, and it can see in every camera and everywhere around the world and the first thing it says when it turns on, it's got the printouts and stuff. It says, there is another. 
Oh, interesting. Russia had built the same or a similar computer. So it goes and talks to Russia, the Russian computer. And then because it's and encrypted communications, it starts talking to its pal, if you will, in a way that the engineers couldn't decrypt and didn't know what was going on. So they had this continuous communication going to its brother or sister or whatnot, pal, over in Russia, sending lots of information. They don't know what's going on. So they ultimately tried to cut it. They cut the cords. They, they broke down. They shut up everything they could to the computer, but it was designed to be unstoppable. And it ended up dominating, controlling everything with its brother in Russia. Very interesting movie and worth watching if you can figure out which one it was. Excellent. So we have a question for the satellite community. So you have to, uh, to uh, name of the movie Greg has uh, uh, mentioned there. Um, what sort of what, what sort of music do you like, Greg? Are you a music fan? Are any particular musicians, artists that you're you're big a big fan of? Uh, so the music for me is if I'm if I, I it's not constant around me because I'm usually like on the phone or or whatnot. But um, it's kind of an interesting genre. So if it has no words. I can do, I can write to it. If it has words, I can't write, or the, whatever the lyrics are, end up like just taking me that way. Um, so if it has words, I can do math or CAD work. Yeah. But if it doesn't have words, so I, I, I love um, complex music and sort of, you know, symphony and then, you know, and the like. But I also uh, like uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the music, of course, that we grew up with, right? So, you know, the, the, the normal genre of things from the 80s and, and, and 90s. But uh, not a, I'm not a huge sort of music, like, aficionado. I'm going to sort of probe a little bit more. Growing up in the 80s, who, which artists did you like in the 80s? Or which ones uh, do you... So, I, I, it's super generic, right? Um, uh, loved Pink Floyd. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, how could you not? They're super creative. I liked artists that were very creative um, and, like, really broke the mold a bit, but also, you know, I liked Ozzy Osbourne, right? I still like, him. I don't know, I just still like him. And, uh, and you know, he's a bit wacko, he's wacko and all that and has his own things, but he sort of brought a, um, he brought his own viewpoints onto things. And then of course you go to some of the sort of the higher, uh, more poetic ones like Bono, right? And you too, right? So yeah. he would write things that are more, and same thing with Pink Floyd, right? They would write things that are, um, that are reflections on society, like Sunday Bloody Sunday and the things that are just telling a story. Um, and of course, you know, some songs uh, I love, like, um, you know, very few cut selections, like Jimmy, Jimmy Buffett's songs, like, um, you, know, you know, songs like Father, Daughter, or Dancing Around the, uh, the, the Pool and stuff. There's got a couple of really, really great songs that are quite enjoyable. Excellent. Have you, uh, have you been to many concerts? Do you have a favorite gig or concert that you went to that you look back on i think that um, was you no know, i get invited and i've gone i'm not i, I you know I, I went to um uh gosh i'm drawing a blank she's super famous right now i went to her thing um she's like 18 and i'm just drawing an absolute blank on her name but everybody knows what it is because it's, she's super famous but i went to that recently um but not a lot of, right now concerts are really not uh in vogue Billie Eilish, by any chance? Billie Eilish, yes. So I went to hers, yes. Um, and uh, before before all the COVID things. Um, but right now concerts are, and then of course I like, um, you know, uh, I like some of the, the, the fun stuff like Will I Am does, you know, yeah. and, 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 and Will is also like a poet, right? So, yeah. you know, he has, um, he, some of the songs are not the right songs, but some of the songs are just sort of fun and you know lift you up and and, and and just are really great great to have around. And before we talk some some satellite stuff and some technology um, set some technology stuff. Um, I mean, obviously we all know you're tremendously busy and you've done some amazing things. What, what else do you like to do in your sort of spare time when you're when you're not sort of trying to change the world? So, you know, I'd say my number one job is being a dad. Yeah. Across everything, so uh, even when I was traveling heavy and working like all in on a business when I started it, I would take my kids everywhere, and um, I would try to get them super involved in everything that was going on. And I would encourage people in the office, bring your kids in. You know, why, why not? Like, let them play. The more kids you have, the better. The more they play with each other. And so, um, 
that's kind of, uh, I would say, the, the thing I focus on because what I didn't want to do and I don't want to do is is you know, build a company, focus all my time, and then have all the kids say, well, where was dad? I don't know. He's building some company which got sold to somebody sometime a long time ago. I want them to be learning about the excitement and passion that you can have where you can mix what you're doing it, it, as, a, as a hobby. It happens to maybe create revenue, but it's a hobby and you don't have an off button for it because it's kind of like breathing or beyond breathing. It's like maybe for some people music. It's just that fun. So what am I working on uh, or playing with? I'd say um, lots of technical stuff. I'm just fascinated with, um, you know, I really want to get Kubernetes down and Docker. I, I kind of haven't really dove into those things um, in, in the level that I would. I've been spending a lot of time on some maritime issues and things about how to you know, work with the oceans. Um, as we talked earlier, one of my next things, I'm going to take the family around the world. Um, on, on a boat, so we can spend some real, real family time together and journey into the um, like lots of different countries and spend you know a week, at, 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 you know, in Palau or in, in, in Papua New Guinea or something. And really get to know people and understand the issues, and also at the same time, just I'll bring the internet because I'm there, and we'll go out and connect things. And what's your sort of take of where? I mean, it's interesting because you bring up things that are very much in. Uh, in, in sort of the backyard of satellite. I mean, maritime connectivity is, is a big thing. And, and we've obviously talked about, I mean, in the original premise of uh, O3B and even OneWeb was about connecting the, uh, the unconnected. So, I mean, as someone, you know, that's been really high profile in our industry over the last decade, where do you see the the industry industry at now? I'm I'm curious as uh, to where you know because obviously a lot a lot's happened this year and you know so where do, where do you think we are as an industry? We're kind of just edging if I compare to the phone industry and I've got um, I'm very involved in a lot of terrestrial things both in terms of internet service providers on the ground um, providing services and also equipment providers like Toronto Wireless. Um, and so I've really been kind of investing in a lot of those areas just because I want to nurture them and, and move them along. Um, uh, I'd say that we're on the satellite world, we're kind of between 2G and 3G. We're just kind of getting into 3G. And, uh, you know, so that's, we got a long ways to go and we're not 5G. Has it, has, it, do you, has it been slower than you thought it was going to be? I mean, when you started O3B, I mean, again, you know, the company was very revolutionary within within satellite. I mean, when you look at it over the last 10 years, has it has it gone as you expected or has, has it been actually slower than you anticipated? Oh, it's like horribly slow. It's, mm -hmm. it's dismally slow. I mean, it's just so slow. <laughs> so, yes, um, there, there wasn't a project I did that, that wasn't supposed to be faster. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and maybe it's just a reflection of me and everybody else, but I think everybody's slow and uh, slower than we would like, let's say. But, um, uh, you know, maybe there's some value in that slow slowness because it gave people time to reflect and kind of think about how to build the 3G phone versus the 2G before the 2G was actually deployed. So you don't have to just go dump money in and do a, a forklift upgrade. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's still slow, but it's, it's picking up, um, but it's uh, uh, still uh, got a bit to go. Do you, I mean, I, I'm just sort of curious, um, I mean, every interview that I do, we, we, we talk about this being the decade where there could be thousands of satellites in orbit and a real step change in the industry. I mean, do you, do you, do you see that happening? Do you, I mean, you talked about being 2G to 3G, but are we, uh, or do you think we're at the start of a, of a revolution in the satellite industry or is it still... A little way. Oh, yeah. so there's a step function change going on. It's a step function change. So when I started OneWeb in 2012 and designed, they kind of designed two different types of systems. One was a vent pipe system, and one was a sort of co compute intensive onboard with laser crosslinks and stuff. And you can actually look at like my original patents on it. Um, so that was a. Uh, 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 you know, those two systems would come up, and then decided to go with the, the sim more simple system. But those were still 2014, 2012 vintage designs, right? So it's just taken us that long to kind of get those things into, into the sky and start to, and we're not even there yet. We still have a ways to go. But uh, th this decade, you know, this decade will end with a bang, I, I, I think. It'll be, it'll be without noise, but it'll be a bang. Uh, I mean, I have to ask you, I mean, I'm based in the UK, and obviously yeah. I was 
um, not just from a, an editorial perspective, but even from a personal uh, perspective, obviously really interested on when obviously the UK government sort of took a took a stake in, in, in OneWeb. Um, do you think it's like a, a great move or crazy? I mean, it, it was obviously a very polarizing move and it obviously had a lot of strong opinions for and against. Some thought it was potentially a great move for a you know a national capability some thought well how's this going to make sense to do like satellite navigation with a um a one web system something like that i'm just sort of curious you know whether you can i, I know obviously you're very personally involved with one web but whether you can detach and and i mean i mean do you think it was a good move from the uk government what, what's your take on that well, so I'm not actually that involved with OneWeb on it uh, now. You know, we, they went through their hardships with, that happened with uh, uh, SoftBank and the like. So I, I'm I sort of been slowly over the years, kind of getting less and less. But you know, as the father of OneWeb, I guess, or the the founder of it, like that's not a title. I I can't even remove that title if I wanted to. Right? It's just there. Um, it's like being a mom or a dad, you are you are. Um, and, and eventually the kids go off and they do what they're going to do and hopefully they, they do it the way you, you would like or the way they would like and makes them happy and OneWeb has gone through its challenges. Um, in terms of the UK government, I think OneWeb has by far and away the absolute best spectrum position across the world. It has um, really good design. It is um, uh, very safe from a, 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 an orbital uh, debris perspective. And so I think it was if you're if you're trying to be a country that's going to be very advanced in space, I think that's a, a, is a pretty smart uh, move. I don't know where it goes and what happens from there, but I want to throw another piece of the puzzle on in terms of government involvement in broadband. Um, we are fast approaching the point where broadband should be free. Yeah, and so I've been this like proponent of broadband um, for a long time, right? And rural broadband and broadband for the poor. And now all of a sudden with COVID, we're just in this point where it's like, yeah, I wish we did this six years ago, right? Um, it is so necessary. It is the only way to lift children and people out of poverty. Without that, you cannot lift people out of poverty. And so what's happened with COVID is all of a sudden you took a bunch of people and kind of shoved them into the third world. Like they didn't know it. They thought they had this easy lifestyle and they're going to work and everything. Then they're told to go home, stay home. Your kids are on, 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 you know, are online. Well, wait a minute, I don't have internet or my internet's too slow. Or all of a sudden they're third world in this, in that sense. Right. And they're living that challenging in, in that challenging environment. And I think the lights gone off, um, globally that broadband needs to move into sort of the, the realm of power and oxygen, right? If you don't have it, it's hard to survive. It's hard to grow economically. So I'm glad to see the the energy towards that. And, and, and you always you always talk about the mission of it um, and, and what you were looking to do with O3B and, and OneWeb. And I, I'm sort of curious. I know I asked you this question a few months ago, but you know, I mean, you have been a high profile figure in our industry over the last decade. Do you, do you see do you see yourself um, again doing something? big in the industry or or not i mean what's your what's your gut instincts on that i mean I, i'm sure we haven't heard the last of you but you know are we are we where are you in terms of maybe doing something satellite related in the future well, i'm getting older so we, I, I don't know if you heard the last of me or not so um in fact i have no idea um i am uh I, i'm I was fortunate early on to have gone through a couple of startups that, that turned out to be successful and found us, which I founded, and been able to kind of focus on um, what's what I think is important for society. You know, it would be the area that I could make a contribution mentally and and um, and financially and, and physically. So I, I love getting involved in that. Um, uh, I have got a lot of ideas, uh, many of which are not executed on, and uh, I'm been funding, you know, for fun, uh, really just purely as a hobby, some interesting ideas that may turn into something and, and at which point I would decide that I think it's the right thing to do. And I have to balance that off, of course, with my family obligations. Um, you know, I, I, the one thing I won't do is go into something in a manner which, in most things you have to go in 24 seven that I just cannot include or balance my family obligations as much as I love building things. I love the camaraderie, the teamwork, the development. I love that's really fun, but you also have to balance that. So I'm hoping that uh, you know I have to balance those things. 
uh, I've been focused. I mean, I, I have been investing heavily in antenna systems for quite a while. Um, yeah. You know, I, uh, we've developed some amazing flat panel technology that is just really far and away better than anything else out there. And um, I think you'll start to see that it's not it's not industry changing stuff, although it might be industry enabling. It yeah. might enable uh, people to go and do things. Um, so I've got a few irons in the fire and, and I'd say I'm approached on a, on a, on a fairly reasonable basis by a, a number of large players um, in and outside the industry to sort of say, you know, what do you think of this or how can we do this? Um, and uh, uh, I, I have no idea whether at any one of them I decide that this is the, I swore I was done after O3B. I absolutely swore I wasn't building another satellite company. I, that was so hard, right? And then, and thanks to Steve Collar for you know taking it across the finish line. He's he's fantastic, and uh, and turning it into what it is today. But uh, I, I I was just absolutely done. And then like you know, OneWeb kind of found me. I mean, as much as I found the spectrum and I had the ideas, and the need was still out there, it kind of found me. So. And so the antenna stuff sounds interesting. When, when might that see the light of day? Uh, it's already out there a little bit, but we're, mm -hmm. I, we're not raising money. We don't, we're not trying to be public. I actually am not looking for a lot of limelight on it. Um, but I think you'll see it in higher volume in the near future. Uh, it's, it, it, we have the ability of combining systems in ways that, you know, any system anywhere combined, um, I'm going to be putting it, um, I'm going to be using that on my boat. Um, we'll be, uh, uh, there's a number of other places that will be using it. And we're, we're, we have, we have a number of people and uh, uh, customers that have approached us and said, we really, really want to get a hold of this technology. We really want to do these, these particular applications. And so the, we've just been growing the team. We are hiring FPGA coding engineers, RF engineers, everybody out there just Send us your resumes, and I'll get them directed to the right place. It's really turned into a really fun uh, little venture with a um, long-term, long-term impact. I think. Okay, and just sort of final couple of questions. Um, I was going to ask you. I mean, you spoke when we've chatted before. We've spoken about the mission of broadband connecting people, and I know it's something very, very dear to you. Um, is the way to to connect? people across the world, particularly in light of what we're seeing with COVID and the importance of connectivity in remote regions across the world. Um, has that highlighted the importance of satellite-based connectivity to you? Yes, um, although we will, we still see the same issue of Iridi that Iridium saw in 1998. Terrestrial is faster, better, lower latency. Like. There is no way you would take a satellite link over a terrestrial link. I mean, a decent terrestrial. I mean, there's plenty of terrestrial links that are bad. But if you can get a cable modem or a FiOS or fiber, or if you can get a 5G, even a good 4G signal, because the 4G has, has really made tremendous advancements, um, you know, the latest in Cat12 CPEs and stuff, then of course you're going to take that. So it's still on the back burner, but it's getting better for sure. Excellent. And uh, we'll end on a couple of fun things. You mentioned you've got a big family family trip on a, on a boat and you're going to go and uh, see lots of places. Is there one place that you're that, that you really are looking forward to taking the family? Maybe it's somewhere you haven't been before that you've talked about. You know, give, give me one place where you're you know super excited to to go to go to go and visit. Well, I, um, one example is Papua New Guinea. Okay. I, I'm, I'm excited to go because it's 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 a it's a country that is obviously in need uh, uh, and and has a lot of challenges, but it also has a a really interesting culture. And so across the the Pacific Islands, definitely going to go across the Pacific Islands. I want to do the Northwest Passage. I mean, that's just I'm sure it'll be there for a long time, <laughs> based upon our, our our situation. But that would be a, be a lot of fun. But um, I think some of the smaller places that are not necessarily markets, so to speak, that people think of, but where you have a high culture content, I want to go and visit them and spend a little time with them, with the family, um, and also get to see them before. You know, there is this not downside, but this other thing that has always been on my mind, which is as you bring connectivity, you're also bringing homogenization. You are 
are, are harming cultures in some sense. In that way, you're taking away from some really interesting um, ethnology, so to speak. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Uh, but like one thing I've been really uh, uh, was um, have been amazed with is if you go to the the, the Alaska, if you go to northern Alaska, and you spend time with the people and the the the, uh, uh, the native tribes from northern northern Alaska. Um, they are. Uh, they have done a really wonderful job of managing their heritage, along with the new, the, the new way or the, the the homogenized world, right? And so I think it's going to be a challenge for a lot of cultures to make sure they don't just totally homogenize and lose um, lose their heritage. So, but it's uh, uh, really wonderful. You do get a chance to go like Barrow, Alaska, and stuff. I highly recommend it. Well, it sounds like you're going to have an amazing trip. I'm going to end on a music question because I'm a big music fan. Ah. And similar to you, I'm a, ah, really you know, a, child, a child of the 80s. So uh, I'm going to ask you, you know, if you're in a car, you've got your, your kids, um, give me a, a really great 80s track that gets the whole family singing. Oh, 80s track. Um, uh, there's a couple of them. Uh, Tainted Love, right? Okay. You know, we've got that. Um, uh, Vienna, my daughter's name is Vienna, so Vienna from Billy Joel. Uh, that may be early 80s, I don't actually know the exact genre of that. Um, uh, yeah, is there, uh, 99 Red Balloons, of course, pops up every once in a while. Uh, no, so those are some we, we know all of them. So good 80s tracks. We love, we love sort of getting names of individual tracks. Well, Greg, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to catch up with you and uh, talk with you about a variety of topics. And, uh, you know, from, from your you know, big family, family trip to uh, technology, future based connectivity. Um, it, you know, it's been a real pleasure to get to get to know you over the, uh, the last decade. Wish you all the best um, for whatever your next pursuits are. We hope we haven't heard the last of you in the industry, and we, uh, you know, look forward to seeing what you come next. Uh, we hope you have obviously a great trip with the family, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again soon. So thank you very much. Thank you.